With this said, I'm recording. So this is Marcin Jakubowski, founder of Open Source Ecology. This is our first ever webinar. The intended audience is people who are interested in getting more deeply involved with Open Source Ecology, and that is people like OSE chapters, OSE ambassadors, and anyone else who wants to join the project in a closer way. So what I'll do is um, go through the history. Basically, introduction is, um, what is the what is the real purpose of this webinar? It's it's to, to the, it's first of all going to be a six part series for the next six weeks, one one per week, and the goal is to pretty much fill the community up, fill fill the community in with the what is relevant to know to get immersed and engaged in the work. What are the opportunities? What are the constraints in the project, so that as we go forward, we can work all work more effectively. So the goals of the six, six webinars are to form just tangible goals, formalize relations with chapters. Right now, there's a number of chapters worldwide that are pretty much, uh, there's not, not anything as far as standards or just uh, firm collaboration interoperability procedures. So we'd like to formalize the relations so that we can uh, move forward more effectively. And we'd like to create o OSE ambassadors, people who are formally aware and and up to date on what's going with our OSE so that they can feed people into the project the way they if, if the chapters start up then there could be a good interaction with people being funneled into the various chapters the the good goal would be if if we could get uh, each single chapter involved in one of the machines so that there's a parallel massive parallel effort going on all the 50 machines at the same time and for that to happen, people have to understand the culture, how we operate, how do we create, co-create, how do we work effectively, how do we share tools and all work together for a common goal? Because uh, in essence, the promise of open source has not really been delivered to date in terms of showing that simply innovation and, and product development or collaboration can happen simply hands down more effectively than corporate proprietary research and development. So. So as we go forth to co-create, create the paradigm for how to do that, I mean, it takes the whole community to do so. And the first thing to note is that we, I mean, we don't have the answers. It's like we're developing everything as we go along. We're developing radical collaborative techniques. We've, we've shown some groundwork on all these topics. So I'll, I'll um, maybe segue into a brief history of OSC in progress to date. So basically in 2011, uh, pretty much the project was put on a world stage with a TED talk so you can say in some way that the history of this project has become really global since 2011 but if you talk about earlier history the first um, I first started the project in 2004 right after leaving the my PhD program and uh, but but the history of the thoughts actually goes way before I actually was born in Poland it's um, behind the Iron Curtain at that time where tanks were rolling down my streets uh, some of the memories I, I remember back from a long time ago. Then I moved to America and and the life has certainly changed. But in Poland, there was a real issue of material scarcity. Moving moving to America, it was great, beautiful, but also after some time I noticed there was a level of artificial scarcity and that's that's what we're trying to address. So, so OSE was born um, right after my PhD program. I finished that in 2004. And basically got into feeling frustrated with the school. You know, you should watch the TED talk if you haven't. I th I'm sure all of you have seen it. Um, started the project and pretty much got onto a piece of land. First we rented some land, and then now we've got our own land here. But the movement itself is based on the the word open source. Uh, we have to talk about open source software as the origin of of the kinds of topics we talk about. Um, so so when we when we go forward in our mission, we pretty much model model by the open source software movement, which in, in the 90s has pretty much come up with the four freedoms known to open software. And, and those four types of freedoms are what we promote in open hardware. Now, just for reference, some, a couple of points to be very clear about in how we operate, and that is... One of the freedoms of, of open software and open hardware is the freedom to do what you want to, including selling, selling the materials. So that's where we're very strict about the distinction between non-commercial and open source. Non-commercial does not qualify as open source, according to the official definitions. Now, there's a lot of people out there in the world today who, who claim or talk about projects, the... Um, 
talk about non-commercial projects as if they were open source, which is not, not really the case. And the distinction is important because if we're going to change economies, you need to allow people to make money with open source hardware. Um, open source hardware as, as far as um, material security, one of the underlying issues in humanity today is we still haven't mastered the distribution of material security to everyone. There's the haves and have nots and, and open source ecology is working on a very fundamental solution to pressing world issues by addressing material security at the core of many underlying issues. So anything that derives from that, like the economy, politics, it's fundamentally based on natural resources. And that's where we want to start with in order to get fundamental solutions to many of the pressing issues today. So progress to date. I want to mention six main milestones in the work. I know how closely everyone has been following the project, but um, the TED Talk was a, over, a good overview at that time. Um, the six major milestones I want to point out to is, um, first of all, let me back up, back up a little bit. And by the way, for anybody who joined, I'm recording this, so everyone has a chance to view this. And there is a, is a practical exercise that's going to come out as a result of this webinar, and that is... Um, the exam will be to take this video, which which I'm pretty much recording here, and I'm going to post this on, on, on YouTube pretty much immediately after. But the exercise, the exam for this is for everybody who's listening to take the video and add any of the links, as in like YouTube subtitles or the YouTube bubbles, so that a person watching this video uh, can click on all the relevant issues, because I'm, all the relevant links, because there's a lot of different pieces of information that gone go into this and it's intended to be a crash course so um, basically um, I'm looking at a presentation right now which I, I can't really share the screen with you right now because I can't do that in my face at the same time but um, I'm hoping that in this exercise all the links will show up after this this is published okay so the global village construction set 50 different machines where are we right now so it's a, first of all it's a set of the 50 different industrial machines that can produce a complete economy Currently, we're, if you look at the, the OSC main site, which is opensourceecology.org, you'll see the status of the project, and you'll see a percentage of completion graph there. And in summary, we're about 25% done. Um, the, by 2013, we prototyped 16 of the 50 machines. Now, at the beginning of 2015, we stand at a total of 110 machines built total, including 27 independent replications around the world in eight countries. One dozen of those are the brick press. That's where we stand today. Six major milestones along that journey. The first major one is that in 2011, pretty soon after the TED Talk, the, a guy in, in Texas replicated our machine, the brick press. And when I first saw that, it looked like it was a Photoshop copy of the machine, but it was a real copy. Uh, so replications have happened, a number of them. The green machine in, in the United States, power cubes, tractor in L.A. Um, there was an attempt of a tractor build in Guatemala. There was an, an Italian brick press, China brick press, tractor in uh, as an art project. Actually, this was in Turkey, another in Texas that was taken to Africa. Another guy currently building with a brick press in Texas. One, perhaps the most interesting one that I've seen to date is uh, a picture I received from, from uh, someone who's been to one of my talks showing um, an operation, and this was in, in, I believe, in Nicaragua, but basically had a whole setup with two of our brick presses and four power cubes cranking out bricks under a roof. And that's that happened totally without my knowledge or our knowledge, and there's houses apparently built down there using the bricks. Um, so replications have happened. That's a major, first major milestone that happened already in 2011. The second major milestone is the one day production time that we've achieved for the builds. So in 2012, we built our brick press in a single day using our swarming collaborative processes where we break the machines down into, into modules and build them in parallel. That's how we, we do things to, so that a crew of people can get involved in it. But the point there is, we don't just produce the machines, we, we then optimize so everything is aimed at real replicability, economic significance. 
and you can see the video of the of the 2012 December 2012 build on YouTube. Uh, the enabling features are literally language agnostic instructionals that we, we have produced, um, a swarming team effort with about 10 people, and that's how we did it. Uh, we're doing the same for every single one of our machines. Our goal is eventually to, to pull together a very big swarm of people so that, so that literally you can build all the machines in a single day, given enough people. So that means pushing the limits of... of uh, division of labor or scalability of the team of swarming so such that the the build process can be designed and uh, the build process and the design is, is done in parallel uh, to to create new possibilities in terms of how people can produce things okay so radical modularity is another major milestone that we've achieved so if you look at our work the all the machines are built from modules such as such as the heavy equipment like the tractors uh, they're made of modular wheel units interchangeable power units uh, universal wheel units which can be applied to many things so basically we we switch in between different machines such that you literally have a lego set of construction available from the from the machine from the set based on a power cube which is a power cube for just about any of the machines the structural frame tubing which can be used anywhere between things like tractor frames, CNC torch table frames, or iron worker machine, which is a machine used to cut one inch thick slabs of steel, which we've built. Um, universal rotor, which can be used as wheel units for the tractor, or a big trencher, or a salt pulverizer rototiller, or a big weed whacker, or a honey extractor. Just really getting crazy on on the kind of modularity where the same t same part can function in many different part in many different places. So the fourth major milestone, next, by using this type of modular construction, we've been able to reduce the prototyping cycles from months to days. That's a big one because then that's just a huge efficiency that's that's placed on top of what we're able to do which indicates that wow we can we can do things much faster than than anyone ever thought was possible down to heavy machines such as we're intending to build our bulldozer this year a 30,000 pound machine over a five-day workshop that's coming up this year I'll talk about that a little later reducing the prototyping cycles from months to days major milestone uh, represented the best with the iron worker machine which the first prototype it took us six months to build that the second prototype radically redesigned simplified using our modular tubing took us 12 hours with two people so six months to a single day that's about a hundred fold compression of build time so we've done similar for the backhoe which we built that in about a week of time um, and we treat everything like a construction set so when when we have individual modules that come together to in the set you can mix and match them so you can have a heavy machinery construction set you can have a construction set for other things including electronics for tractors for cars for just about anything we touch for for energy production for housing production such that uh, I mean a lot of times I get this critique it's like what's going on here it's like you're taking all the fun out of it. why are you rushing it's like well no that's not the point the point is that that in terms of efficiency we're able to to do things that are unprecedented and therefore being able to compete with the mainstream non-sustainable non-regenerative systems that uh, we're trying to improve upon by democratizing technology by putting it in the hands of people okay so i'll go to the fifth major milestone and that is real-time documentation. We've done certain builds like the Iron Worker, for example, where some of our people were re located remotely. They were using Hangouts just like this. We had it pointed at, we had the Hangout actually looking onto our actual build and we were doing documentation. As we were building, people were documenting and we ended up with getting a real-time instructional right after the Iron Worker was built and a video a few hours later because we took, we took video clips and uploaded them in real time to YouTube so people were able to work with us as we were building 
people were documenting. Now that's a big point because a lot of times when people build things, you just lose all the information. You can never build upon it. But if you document it, that's a whole new story. Then people can can build from where you left off. Okay, so that's milestone number five. Now the sixth milestone is the revenue model, and that's the extreme manufacturing workshop model. So we've succeeded in in hosting a few workshops now. now you can go to the main website to the workshops page. But um, to give you an example, we we can build things like the brick press or even the micro the modular house over a weekend workshop. That's enabled by the fact that the, the production time, like for the brick press, we can take it down to a single day and therefore create a whole event around that, an immersion training and build, so skills training, build collaborative production events that are fun, productive, and um, we intend to make these trans transformative. So to give you an example, with the brick press, we organized a workshop last year where we had about a, two dozen people show up uh, to collaborate on that. It was a three-day workshop. We built the machine. We sold the machine in the same workshop, and we were able to clear $10,000, which was $5,000 from the sale of the machine to actually one of the participants from the workshop. And we collected about $5,000 in tuitions from, from the workshop participants. So this is the kind of model that we're trying to bring forward, and right now we're developing the same for the 3D printer very explicitly because the 3D printer can be a very uh, economically, I mean it's something we can host workshops to fund their operation because the point is throughout the history of this this project people come and go but the deal is we need to start creating economics just like in a software model what do people do they st start selling services around software in the open source world now what's the equivalent for open hardware the equivalent would be uh, services around building machines such as workshops so so if the software is a service that people sell support for software here we can be selling uh, support for building hardware such as the workshops such as uh, producing machines with the assistance of a local fabricator if we open source the plans pr pr prepare all the information that that you need to produce it either with like a local fabricator or in a workshop setting we see that that can go far so on the workshop model we think that because people are hungry for and always will be hungry for real physical productive power that's lost many times in the mainstream economy where everything is virtual um, the human tendency to want to produce and be very meaningful in what they produce is there and and i think a lot of people would benefit from instead of buying all their stuff from China to to they would benefit from going to a local production workshop where you can on demand fabricate anything so you can build your own car you can build your house your energy system and and that kind of participation is something that we don't see in this world today but it's something we're trying to build as a normal option that option does not exist I would love to build my own car that's renewable that's you know off-grid or whatever a house um, lots of products that aren't there because in a consumer society the business model does not allow more creative or more sustainable things to be produced so using the collaborative production model we think about a workshop that can produce anything so imagine walking into this this guided experience where you can produce the things that you need in a real economically significant way. Maybe like Local Motors is doing somewhat, people can produce their cars, but uh, we're trying to do that for just about anything that the current centralized economy can do. So that's the revenue model, um, the, the milestone of showing that we can produce machines. We've sold a few machines already, pretty much as er to, to early adopters, but the next main milestones to be had mean how do we scale the economics can we have our chapters or our collaborators collaboratively de develop workshops that we can all benefit from that's that's the future some of the future steps so that's the um, six milestones achieved so far in a nutshell but the next steps are a flurry of new workshops in 2015 so we're we're going we've actually diversified into quite a, a number of things this year um, pretty much what we've done is largely cut out the student internships 
uh, like last year, we've we've had like 18 students the whole year, but we're, we're transitioning much more to the workshop model to generate revenue and to invite new collaborators to run workshops with us, such as um, already planned for this year, we have the PowerCube workshop. We're going to build our first ever micro track. That's going to be July 13, um, which is a nice tracked machine. And right after that, we're going to build the gasifier to power the micro track with, so that we've never done before. And we're going... From the smaller micro track, we're designing it such that it's highly scalable up to a large tractor and bulldozer size. So I think we're on the cusp of using our design techniques of modularity to be able to produce over a 30,000 pound bulldozer using similar techniques, just pretty much stacking a bunch of power cubes together, uh, using just basically using the building blocks literally like Legos to make very big machines. And that workshop is slated for August of 2015 this year. Now, also we're we're getting we're at this point where our machines are in, to a good enough state that we can really apply them to agriculture. So we're really diving into agriculture. If you've noticed on our lot, um, Facebook and things, first workshop we're offering on that is the is the Miracle Orchard workshop on July 25th, and July 26th, where we show people how to build a diversified perennial polyculture orchard uh, that's one of the things we're doing we're hosting an open source land use planning and geographical information systems GIS workshop right before that as we're getting serious about land stewardship we're putting in all the tools that enable us to do that very effectively from the machines like the tractors to the open source collaborative GIS and drones for aerial mapping and surveying and and basically collaborative open source planning uh, we're we're pulling in people from the OS, OS Geo live project it's open source GIS project um, to teach people about open source GIS basically to the database and to visually manage um, land data orchard data like uh, land use planning data so that's another thing. Uh, we're also hosting a workshop on earthworks where using the bulldozer that we're going to build in August, we're going to host a workshop that we're in September. We're going to use that to do earthworks and ponds. So that's a lot of major developments happening this year. Plans, that's the plans for 2015. Uh, the other main point of 2015 right now is the team building. And this is just like this first webinar for our community we are focusing a lot of energy around team building because one of the main weak points to the project so far has been uh, the lack of leadership or basically people coming and going into the project as a volunteer project and not really being able to sustain itself so um so as the economics come in we want to invite the chapters and collaborators to to do that with us with a goal of building in economics, building in the leadership for all the different teams on one on all the different projects, the 50 different machines, but also all the supporting supporting things like how do you collaboratively do video editing or how do you do collaboratively do graphics or CAD or the organizational structure or the web infrastructure. There's a lot of elements that we want to codify to make it easy for anyone else in the future who wants to replicate such operations? So now let's go to the the big picture of what we see in 20 years. So our model is right now we're developing our prototype facility, factory farm, 30 acres in Missouri. The goal is to finish the, the GVCS, the 50 machines, within five years, such that within 10 years we can build a first full OSE campus at our site here. Now what is this campus thing? Uh, building upon the workshop and immersion training slash production model, we'd like to create a two to four year immersion training program for people to, to take on all over the world. Want to replicate operations like the full integrated operations that we have or to start any kind of operation elsewhere. Now to do that, uh, first we're going to need all the different tools and then the big part about the tools is that they're not just a bunch of random tools, but it's a whole product ecology. So after we build the tools in five years, you want to see how they all work together. Can they really produce an infrastructure for a real community, such as a university-like campus? When you talk about the campus, it will be a, an education 
facility that you can say competes with modern education whereas from my you know from my experience I was quite disappointed what I got out of college I was wishing I, I had much many more integrated practical skills that would allow me to be a real change maker which which is not what happened so we'd like to create an immersion program for people who really want to be the change agents of tomorrow uh, having mastered the ability to build entire infrastructures from scratch so that means the applications are anything you can build yourself a farm you can build yourself a productive enterprise a, a micro factory whatever you like anything that builds the real core of a of an innovation filled sustainable economy that's based much more on local talent local resources and the limit to that is is pretty radical I mean we're pushing it all the way to showing that an advanced civilization can occur completely from any farm any parcel of land that has sunlight soil water rocks plants it's literally as fundamental as that all the modern economy comes from those elements and it's the tools that are much hidden from us, the veil, the technological veil that needs to be lifted to show people that, hey, you can, there's technologies that allow us to go from dirt and twigs into advanced civilization. And that's, that's what we're prototyping. How do you do that? Okay, so the, the campus model will be a, an immersion two to four year program. First one slated to be by, let's say, about 2025. But basically where you go in there and you learn all the radically productive skills of of being a make or being a true producer which means that you have to learn everything it includes history culture it includes technology includes the internet includes biology agriculture everything so we take it from the radically um, you can say integrated hands-on immersion training learn learn the power of productivity by using absolutely open collaboration and we think that in order to, to do such a package it has to be open source because the amount of knowledge required to, to make this happen is intense and uh, why it doesn't happen now is because there's too many firewalls and blocks to access it to anything so we're we're trying to bring those barriers down that's the big program 2025 first full OSE chapter uh, OSE campus and then from that point, we'd like to replicate maybe a couple to see whether they're fully replicable and what's missing, how, you know, is this replicable? And we'd like to see viral replication of that worldwide such that any community in the world can have an option to produce locally, to have autonomous existence, which where we're not worried about yet about economics, politics, because those are all derivatives. You have to start with natural resources and our approach is creating fundamental solutions to pressing world issues with a uh, with an approach of, of addressing material security issues at the very core. That's a common theme here. So next topic. Um, by engaging a community such as we're doing now, by building the relationships with chapters, formalizing our collaborative development techniques of how we, we share the infrastructure or help each other on the tools and techniques we'd like to get to an effort of about a hundred full-time people working on a project by march of 2016. so right now the statistics are maybe like four to six people combined effort of all the collaborators that are working on a project at the present time we'd like to scale that significantly and the way we do it is through our collaboration infrastructure by creating project leaders team leaders that can then independently run their own teams like um, the Linux model uh, essentially where uh, myself and and the existing people on a team can uh, create new leaders that get involved deeply in the project who are those leaders right now Myself, as the founder, we've got Jonathan Kasurek, who is our community manager, consistent contributor. Uh, there's Tom Griffin, who's the PowerCube lead. He's a consistent contributor for many years now. We've got Jean-Baptiste, our graphics lead, who's responsible for the beautiful graphics that you see. Uh, we've got Katerina, who's my wife, uh, and who's also on site here, pretty much dog fooding 
and testing and living with a lot of the technology. And we've got a few advisors that are working with us. We've got a board of directors. Um, as far as some of the other main collaborators that are involved, there's, there's Luca Mustafa, who's from the Caruza project. We're collaborating on a CNC torch table, as well as the 3D printer. There's Jan Lachetti from the Velocar project, who's working on the open source microcar. And um, who else? There's, there's Paolo, who's working on open source aquaponics. So wherever possible, we try to build off existing current projects that have a lot to offer, like recently establishing contacts with people from the FreeCAD project. We're getting Yorick to actually do our aquaponics greenhouse design uh, using all open source software. So we're going to migrate towards Blender and FreeCAD, which are fully capable, but need a little TLC to make them more popular. But we'd like to stand behind using fundamentally open source solution so that the barriers are annihilated for anybody else uh, to, to collaborate with us. Because there's a lot of very subtle barriers when the things are not open source, uh, there's limits to how well you can collaborate. Full, 100 full-time effort by 2016 is our goal. Now there's going to be a major event happening next year over um, about a, over a year from now, next August, not this August, but next August. We're going to build ourselves a half a civilization in one month. What's that mean? That means building uh, basically the, the house and aquaponics using our own machines from the sawmill to the, to the tractor and, and having a radical build where about 100 people show up and we prototype all of the mechanical machines. We will build our workshop, which we will populate with some of the fabrication machines and an aquaponics greenhouse, which we will populate with a living system. So basically a prototype model uh, agriculture slash technology production facility that will use about half of the different machines that are currently in the set. So that's something we're, we're thinking about already in terms of inviting all the collaborators who are capable of contributing significantly to that for August of 2016. So major build, a lot of machines, going to get built at that time. The biggest event to date will happen at that time, marking, you can say nominally, half, half of the different machines being built from the entire Global Village construction set. And after that, we'll move on to a lot more of the power electronics, the ability to now go to the next levels of the project. Right now, we're working at the level of buying things off shelf and then reconfiguring them into machines using steel off shelf and things like that. But the next step is the ability to make our own materials and parts. So as we go further with induction furnace, metal rolling, precision machining, you can not only generate your own stock steel from scrap resource, but also precision parts. So we're going to be getting into things like making our own hydraulic motors and engines after that. There's bioplastics in the set. We can, with induction furnace, we can melt a glass collet to make glazing. We can make bioplastic glazing. Uh, just got some seeds from dandelions for some dandelion resin for rubber production. I mean, there's basically just going to the limits of what can be produced off local resources. So, so that earth can be used to make bricks for our housing. But eventually, with the aluminum extractor from clay, you can, you can actually build aluminum. From aluminum, you can do things like winding for motors, so you can make your own electric motors and things like that. So really pushing the limits of how all the machines in the set can go from dirt and twigs to advanced civilization. And, and we mean that to, to show that. What are the limits of that? You know, is it practical on a 30-acre scale? Uh, someone's got to do that experiment. We, we need some baselines for what the real limits to the energy flows and material flows of civilization are. Now, as far as the baseline of energy, the sun shines at us at 10,000 times more power than the people use on, on the entire Earth today, even with our very wasteful energy system. So we're convinced that energy is not the limiting factor. Uh, and from energy comes all the tr material transformations that happen in, in civilization. That's why uh, fundamentally on the back of an envelope, it looks beautiful that the feasibility is there for doing all these things and one by one we're we're going through this to test if this is true starting with things like producing our own charcoal this year 
to power our own micro tractors using the gasifier. So now we're going back into producing our own fuels and so forth uh, to, towards the limits of what can be done. Okay, to continue, that's, so that's pretty much the milestones progress to date. Uh, big picture plan is to develop the Global Village construction set, but not that's, that's the actual physical, physical product we're creating. But the other product that's even more interesting is the methodology of how you create a collaborative process for having a lot of people work together in unison on this big, hairy, audacious goal. So now let's dive into maybe the some of the tools and techniques that we use. Um, let's let's talk about the basics. Just diving into the weeds here. I mean, how do you do this? I mean, first of all, you want to work all in cloud collaborative platforms as much as possible, and that's what we're doing. Doing things like uh, collaborative Google Docs, and at any time when I say Google Docs or whatever, we know that's part of a centralized uh, monopoly, if you may. Uh, we're always open to open source software if it exists for doing all the features that we do. But until that point, we, we also use proprietary tools, of course, like we're talking on Google Hangouts here right now and things like that. But whenever available, we, we go to those communities with the open tools and, and approach them to help us develop the open, open tool chains, open workflows around the open tools, such as with the FreeCAD, Caden Live for video editing, um, there's collaborative, there's compositing software that's open source. There's just about anything you can find, GIMP and, and Inkscape for graphics. Uh, we're trying to pull those communities in. Whenever possible, we use cloud collaborative platforms. Take an example of a simple Google Doc or a, or a Google presentation where many people can collaborate as a team. So if you have a working team, we can get together and go through a design or just a conceptual design or or collaborative work where everyone learns to type in. So it's like a very basic skill. Can you actually work on a computer collaboratively, creating a document where in the limit of that, you can get a lot done. So we're trying to create workflows that allow that to happen. Like for example, and to give you an example, the aquaponics. To develop an aquaponics greenhouse, it's an integrated system, but it can contain say 100 crops. So if it has 100 crops, well, if you have a properly designed working method, you can, in principle, take a hundred people and, in parallel, knowing that we, uh, knowing a, a particular protocol for for how you do it, where do you put your information, how do you communicate, you can work in principle in parallel. And we're trying to push the limits of what that is, for anything that we do. Just like great example, the icons, uh, the graphics icons, where we're creating pattern language icons to help with communicating our work. We have a protocol now, and we can distribute that protocol to many people so that we can scale that project pending a, a well-organized team, which we started that project. We kind of lapsed it a little bit right now. We want to get back to it. But, but for anything that we do, we want to create collaborative workflows that allow many, many people to, to work together. So that's the topic of collaborative literacy. Um, how do we understand the process enough so that many people can work together so that the limit of that would be anything that happens within a project, any other collaborator would know about it. How do you make it happen? Well, there's some things we, we do to do that, to make that happen. I mean, right now, we have that partially worked out. I mean, we, we talk about using Facebook to communicate constantly, put up our collaborative edited docs there consistently on a wiki. We have things like a person's work log. So for example, I don't have to guess or anybody on the project can look at work logs, you know, Jonathan log, Marchin log, you can see what's going on in the project. So the question which we don't have fully worked out is, I mean, what are exactly all those things that allow this project to communicate autonomously so that it's absolutely transparent and anyone can see what's going on? So that's the general theory. We'll get more into the details of what would allow that to, to happen in, in subsequent uh, webinars, but for now, Keep in mind the problem statement that what does it take to, to have anybody in the project be aware of everything else? So that's as a team, as the open source community, open source ecology community, chapters, collaborators, ambassadors, we want to get that common understanding by talking to each other, finding out you know what are the best practices for that and how do we make that happen. So the uh, 
some of the things just as basics what we do I mean there's Facebook there's videos and actually this particular example of this video when after I post this up we're gonna experiment with can people actually in this you know as a little exercise for collaboration can the people on this call or, or other collaborators actually take the video download it or just take it to their own Facebook and start adding stuff like links to the different materials that I've been talking about uh, we're developing that kind of process using Caden Live, where sharing a project file on your desktop, you can download big files from YouTube, edit locally, such that a whole team of people can do collaborative video editing, where typically the block is where how do you access the files. Well, there's professional tools that allow you to do that. They may cost a lot of money, but using simple processes, we can also do that, for example, using a Caden Live open source video editing project file and we've experimented a little bit with that so um, wherever we do anything we try to th figure out ways how do we do it as a bigger team uh, so there's many many details just just about anything or like you know how do you do CAD collaboratively how do we create libraries of parts so that for example for the tractor construction set you just pull down um, the parts from a piece of software and actually that's what we're doing we're working on that right now for the aquaponic greenhouse and then later for the tractor we're going to put all the libraries, meaning the parts like the power cube, the wheel units, everything, into the FreeCAD package. So you can just drag and drop, put it into your document, and start mixing and matching and, and actually designing using engineered components that we've already developed, such as the power cube, such as universal wheel rotors and m modular tubing for frames and things. That brings the barrier down from engineering to child's play and that's a great example of how we can simplify the process of collaborative design using um, just radically transparent techniques just making that access happen for everybody so imagine you can design something in FreeCAD uh, then you can build it in real life because the difference is unlike Legos the things that we're designing correspond to real objects in real life that that are powerful like the like the bulldozer as the case in point we're gonna max that out to 150 horsepower this year by using our 27 horsepower power cube simply stacking them together so that kind of power where you can make some of the world's heaviest equipment or powerful machinery as anybody just reduce the barriers from whatever John Deere or whatever case or Caterpillar uh, people can do that at home too in your backyard great okay so that's the kind of uh, nature of problem that we're approaching, just really lowering the barriers, creating collaborative tools. Um, I just want to talk, so it's already one, um, we've got a few more minutes of talking. So let's talk about collaborative culture and then I'm gonna wrap it up. So the thing that I really want to emphasize is the distinction between open source and non-commercial. That's definitely very important. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion happening around that topic the non-commercial clause versus fully open source. So to sum it up, non-commercial is not open source. We don't do that. And for the reason that you need to allow people to make money freely from whatever we're designing so that people are motivated. Um, people can be motivated for various reasons, for reasons of sustainability or regenerative economies. Some people will are strapped for cash and they will need to make money or whatever. And that's why you want to motivate those people too. We don't want to exclude anybody. Someone wants to uh, contribute because they want to make a commercially viable product, let them contribute. We don't want to cut out that kind of contribution. And for that reason, the NC does not play with us. Um, Non-commercial, we don't do that. There's uh, basically, uh, there's a lot of work in Europe coming regarding the pure production license, all that. I think that's somewhat confusing to the OS open source community because studying history, the open source movement software movement in the 90s has figured it all out the four freedoms have been designed defined the open source initiative stewards those four freedoms the open source hardware association uh, defines what open source hardware is and then there's people who are thinking that they can create a model that fosters more collaborative effort while avoiding appropriation by corporate interests well, the, open, the bottom line to that is the open source definition already addresses that issue. Now, specifically, um, the open source license can have a viral clause, meaning that you have to share 
if you use this, you have to share it. That means that if any corporation wants to use it, we love that because they have to share it. If they use our work, then any, con any improvements that come from them, legally they would have to share. So that's great. That, that issue of non-appropriation is already addressed by the open source definition. There, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But just um, the, why I mention that is that, so m more points about open collaboration. I mean, I actually, if you look at my, if you ever got an email from me, you see a disclaimer at the bottom that says, I work openly. I do not sign NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, uh, because they don't help open collaboration. That's paperwork. That's competitive waste overhead. I'd rather avoid it. But still, there's people who, uh, I like to make the point, I encourage any of you to put a disclaimer that you work openly if you work openly in your email because a lot of times I get, you know, our name is Open Source Ecology. I get emails from a, actually one tractor developer, small tractor developer, forget the name. But they came to me saying, oh, yeah, we'd love to collaborate on, on the tractor. And, and, I, and because I know some of these insights, I, I asked, well, are you open source? And, and because the first thing they actually... They, uh, they told me is okay well if you want to collaborate sign this NDA I said no we don't do that so the point is even though our name is open source ecology people don't connect that we work in open source so I like to make that explicit which is kind of funny to me but uh, I like to be very clear about it because a lot of times you get into discussions and then after a few bouts back and forth you find out oh these guys are actually proprietary they they don't share any don't have any plans online um, they're not interested in, in public work, they're interested in proprietizing that, in which case we're not interested, so we make that not known up front. So how do you know if somebody's open or not, whether you can work with them? I mean, but the first thing is, do they have a repository? I mean, do they have designs that are online somewhere that you can access? Because someone can say that we're open source, but without the plans, those are meaningless words. Someone can tell you that, oh yeah, you know, we're open, we're open source. Uh, the first question is, show me your blueprints because if if we're engaging in serious collaboration with somebody and they're either pretending i mean there, there can be a lot of pseudo open source going on out there a lot it's a it's a buzzword definitely a lot of people love to abuse it now, there's a lot of projects out there that call themselves open source that are nc that are non-commercial so that's just something to to look out for but the thing is do they have plans that are online where is their repository um now, beyond that, there's also other elements, like um, regarding open culture. If that open so is it the, the next question, that's actually the Caruso project, that's Luca Mustafa, came up with a term called useful source. What is that? Well, beyond open source, is that can you actually do the plans actually work enough to do a meaningful product? Can you replicate it? Because you, there's some plans that, that without having tools or without having specific insights, the plans are not enough to replicate something. In principle, the open source definition says you have to put everything in there, but it doesn't make it explicit exactly how you do that. And some of these standards are much needed, like exactly what are the, all the formats, what are the pieces of information that you need to, for something to be replicable. So the useful source concept is very, very powerful because even if you... Um, have the blueprints can you actually replicate something and that's the uh, meaning behind this useful source concept and then the, the, you know you can take this discussion a little further for example like tesla's cars which are in principle open source i mean i've never seen the blueprints but if you have machines or like a million dollar machine that's required to make this one part well, that doesn't make it particularly useful source or quite useful to OSC if we're talking about a small, small, small distributed production facility being able to, to replicate it. So you have to pay attention also to whether it's really reproducible or not, in essence. Now, in a Global Village construction set, we do have some high-tech capacity, including industrial robots, CNC multi-machines, I mean, scanners and 3D printers and... Uh, up to extraction of aluminum from clay, up to hot metal rolling to get get virgin metal from the scrap. So there's a lot of power in there. But whenever we do do use the tools that we use, we always think about well, how how can people get most most benefit from it? How can it be the simplest, most powerful design that we that we can produce? So there's um, so we're running into. 
some time constraints here. So I'm going to st start quitting my discussion here. But I do want to wrap up with, um, let's see, some of the things that I might have missed. Um, I'll, I'll just start summing up here because, we're as I said, we're going to have five more of these webinars. The goal is eventually to get 50 chapters or, or collaborations distributed worldwide such that each chapter or each group takes on ownership or leadership of one of the technologies. It could be multiple groups doing a single, uh, the same technology. We'd, we'd hopefully like to see that whatever projects OSC in the United States is working on, that people can collaborate on that along the active projects that we have, uh, such as the really getting serious for this year. One of the main goals is to show the full power of the agricultural machinery, starting with the micro tractor. We're not doing that for fun. That's Katarina's going to use that. I'm going to use that. We're going to put a gasifier on it to run it from local biomass. Um, we're going to use it for real work, for microagriculture tasks. Then that's going to get scaled up to the bigger tractor and a whole bulldozer, backhoe, all that infrastructure we're really aiming to complete this year. And I think we've got a really good handle on the scalability of the basic tractor construction set. So we encourage any chapters to, to actually get involved in that. And there's many other things that can be done. Uh, just take start taking all the machines. But the key is how do we create collaborative processes, uh, working teams, like the working team structure. Recently, we've moved much more into, into working teams. We've got several working teams currently. You can see the working teams page on the wiki for all the active teams that are there right now. And um, other than that, I think I'll pretty much wrap up. So to summarize, I look forward to five more of these conversations. Next session is going to be when we make the working teams how do you start a team properly so that the governance and everything is there uh, to make an effective project? So basically, next session will be how do we create a team charter? Uh, one of our advisors, Laura, was, is going to lead that with myself in the next coming next week at the same time. Now, here's your exam. Exam is a follow-up survey, first of all, to take... Um, we'd like to learn because we're going to build these webinars and we're going to revisit them. First of all, we're going to publish the everything on YouTube and, of course, any source files. Like if we end up editing these, we'll publish the source files in Caden Live so that others can edit. But the first first task is take the survey. Did you find this useful? What was missing from this webinar? Did it suck? Was it good? Give me your comments. So I'm, I'm, uh, here's the link to that. So I just pasted in the link. Please fill out that survey as a result of this webinar and a second assignment for your exam that is take this video independently of any, anybody else add as many links as you can to all the things that I talked about because just about anything has got some wiki page or some video or something uh, or some main site page and just paste it in as Google basically the Google pop-ups with the links now, in order to make that truly collaborative, that's our first experiment. So we like to make the road by walking here. When you do that, you will have to put a link to that as a comment under the original video so someone else can find it. So as I was talking about, how does everybody become aware of where everything is? Well, a simple thing to do is under the video that I post, so I'll post this video online, I'll, I'll Facebook where it's at and email you guys. But um, if you make any changes to this video, please upload it to... or share where that is as a comment under the original video. And we can go through that iteratively and see who participates, uh, make this video better. Um, let's see. So with that, I think I'll wrap this up. Uh, thank you for listening. And let's open it up to questions from the community. So let's, let's take about 15 minutes or so, uh, possibly 30 minutes of questions. This is all being recorded one more time so that anyone else who missed it can take this and run with it. All right, people. Do we have any questions? I see everyone's pretty much muted. Um, unmute yourselves and fire away. Hi, Martin. Uh, it's, it's Leopold from Austria. Leopold, hi. Great to hear uh, you. I have a question. Uh, Tell us briefly you who you are and, and your efforts. Can you, can you briefly introduce uh, yourself about your project? Just so everyone else knows. 
Okay, my, my, my project is uh, Open Land Lab. Uh, I bought some land in southern Austria and uh, mm -hmm. I want to... Uh, I, I'm in, in open source software projects since mm -hmm. a very long time. Mm -hmm. And now I want to move to open source hardware. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we, we started with, with, we are starting with some prototypes on uh, aquaponics and, mm. and aeroponics and permaculture and uh, uh, I have a question to, to what you mentioned about open source hardware. Mm -hmm. do, do you have any strategy against uh, patent aggressors? Uh, patent aggressors such as, can you be more specific? Uh, we, we are afraid that uh, if we uh, commercialize uh, open source hardware, mm -hmm. we, we get in trouble with, with somebody mm -hmm. uh, telling us that we, we... Are infringing on their patent? Yes, yes. Okay, so this is precisely the kind of case where collaboration worldwide is useful. Uh, yeah. This is part of the legal background that needs to be researched. Currently, we don't have a legal advisor on our team. We would like to get a perhaps a board member who can advise us on legal issues from things like, okay, product liability, patent search. What you've discussed just now is an issue of patent research and understanding what's doable and what's not. Typically, there's a lot of stuff that if it's published already and you do it according to published methods, typically it's fine. But I'm sure there's going to be some, some weird thing like rounded corners on an iPhone that's going to get us at some point, right? So for that, for one, a lot of times we are safe from that because a lot of times we are building old technologies or nothing that's just re reconfiguring existing things. But for those cases where, where we do run into it, we need some professional advice. So that's where I would su suggest that we can potentially create something like a legal working team. Uh, we don't really have one right now to address all these issues. So the legal field is gonna be a big, like once we actually start getting traction, where we're producing stuff, people are using it, and we're knocking out the invading colonials, we're gonna hear it. So we're gonna to have to be ready for that. Now the, the best thing to do is be very open and, and say that the way we position our project is that we're, we're in a nonprofit organization, we're doing for everybody's benefit, uh, our approach a lot is that we invite everybody to the table. Like, for example, if John Deere wants to collaborate, great. Uh, or if they want to, you know, squash us, say, hey, uh, guys, have you thought about actually producing this yourself or whatever? You know, just just don't be confrontational. We know there's a lot of weakness and insecurity out there. People are killing each other. I mean, that's the st industry standard, so to say. Uh, but it's about creating culture. So by, by creating uh, enough popular support... At the point where there's enough popular support, this thing will go forward. And I, and I think the best strategy right now is to be very inclusive and open about how we operate. And then, of course, we, we do need legal, real technical legal support for this as well. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Great. Um, questions? So, I mean, the follow-up to that is, I mean, we, we really do need a working team on the legal issues. Like, for example, on the brick press, just first of all, writing down disclaimers that need we need to include on our websites and our on, on our documentation. Uh, that's the main thing. Otherwise, there's no patents that I know of that are any kind of issue. But for Europe, I, I guess there were legal troubles in Italy. People were trying to produce that. The Italy chapter was trying to get into production. And apparently, they ran into legal issues about about production certification or whatever. In America, it appears to be much less so, but of course there's going to be certain issues. Uh, the, the issue of liability can be addressed a lot by selling kits, which means not finished things, which, is, which could be fine. Or the workshop model also addresses that in some way, in the sense that the builder is actually the, the user. So there's different ways to go about it, but, but altogether there's a lot of innovation that needs to be happening as we develop a new paradigm. Uh, that means paradigm, new paradigms on all the different fronts. Okay. I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, can hear you. Yeah. Uh, have you researched 
about past efforts to build communities such as the communes of the 60s. Uh, there mm -hmm. was a place called The Farm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the Venus Project. Yeah. Disney World as a bad example is, have you, uh, so what have you learned from those sources? Yeah. What were those sources? Yeah, a lot of, I mean, everything that you mentioned and then some, I mean, they're some, perhaps the best example of existing eco villages maybe things like Oroville maybe the farm um, our mission is a little different we're less an intentional community than we're, we're a nonprofit organization and we're gonna structure more as a like a research and development or university campus than an intentional community so when we have people enter the project it's not because we're, they're gonna live here it's because they're working on a project uh, so that's that's what the learnings from a lot of these communities are the importance of economics, uh, because when people check out uh, like we have <laughs> in some way into the wild outside the mainstream system, uh, the thing that comes out really quickly is that you need to recreate effective production and economic viability in some way. Uh, the learnings are how important that is, that there's many different forms of capital, but at the same time, we have to concern ourselves with economically significant production at the end of the day. And hence is what you see with our drive for efficiency, that the things can simply ex coexist or take over the existing system. They have to be as efficient as industry standards. So that's that in a nutshell would be the main lesson that there's that that a real community will require all the different elements from production to governance to all the elements of a village um, and we're gonna prototype what that looks like um, a unique mix of a university campus but the different thing is that it's gonna rely it's going to be a real deep immersion experience, real crash course, so that we are actually using local resources and uh, trying to do everything just as much locally as possible. So really pushing the limits of what the local governance and material use would look like with closed loop material and energy cycles. Uh, but not to freak anybody out, I mean, really structured as a, hey, this is a campus, you know, here's where you live, here's where you work, here's classrooms, here's production. Uh, try to put it into a form that's acceptable within mainstream society, um, that has the trappings. We don't have to, we don't believe in having to run into, back into this, the Stone Age. something on and they're playing over your voice. Okay. Um, yeah, if anyone could, who's got that please mute yeah so the point is that we will have to as we as we roll this this out we want to be as as palatable so to say um, as possible by by providing and basically allowing for a modern somewhat normal standard of living to happen and it seems like a lot of the, I mean, just a critique of the eco-villages, a lot of that is, is kind of like uh, people breaking off from society. Whereas for us, it's more about us contributing back to society, where if you come into a place like, like Open Source Ecology or one of its campuses, it's about contributing to society. It's not about removing yourself from it. So uh, I think... Okay, so you have, you have researched a lot of other uh, attempts to create... Like yeah, this. the number one failure is the absence of a working economy, and that's what we need to address at, as, in a nutshell. Okay, and I do have other comments, but I wanted to wait until everyone else gets their okay. questions first. Any other questions from somebody else? Hi, Marjan. This is Franz from Vienna. Franz, hello. Um, since we were just uh, talking intentional communities, uh, yeah. haven't we been uh, since... Uh, Katarina, I think, is from Portugal. Have you been in touch with uh, Tamera and the Solar Power Village? Uh, have you talked to them? Actually, haven't. But I did contact them regarding their the the nature of the solar machine there. But that uh, the last time we checked, it wasn't open source, though. So we didn't really pursue any of those contacts. No, given Portugal, yeah, I was actually considering visiting that, but we actually never ended up uh, visiting there. It would be interesting to see. Mm-hmm. I was uh, I mean, uh, encouraged that because uh, I tried to, to talk you in Kleinwächter into collaboration with OSE 
and I think eventually we will see that happen. Yeah, I would love to see that. Yeah. Mm. That will be good. We Let's show some open design. If that's available, we're, we're all ears, as you okay. know. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, okay, other other questions or comments? Martin? Yes, go ahead. James Wade from uh, Cape Creek. James, hi. Uh, quite, how do you envision a uh, remote workshop uh, revenue sharing with the main campus? When you do a right. So it depends on uh, the way it's organized. So if we're going to run it here, I mean, what? okay, first of all, the number one thing is instructors, who's going to do that? When we invite instructors, like, for example, the Miracle Orchard Workshop or the Gasifier, our basic package is 50-50 revenue share after after expenses. So whoever is the, the collaborator, like Tom Griffin's running the PowerCube Workshop, so we're going to pay him 50% of whatever the proceeds are net. Uh, that's the usual arrangement. Um, if the other party wants wants to do that absolutely independently from us, we can potentially help on advertising. But there's different scenarios we can talk about. But the number one thing is how do we train the people who can run the workshops? To scale this effort, we need to do that. And we don't have a training program for the, the people who would run workshops yet. That's one of the things we want to develop. It's one of the great topics that we can start a working group on, perhaps. But basically, class, I mean, training materials for one, I mean, I guess the number one step would be to attend one of the workshops and then think about how do you get trained to do it fully. So, I mean, people like Tom who've been involved in a project, I mean, they, they've got all the skills already. So, I mean, he knows how to, how to do things. But if we want to scale that to a much bigger, bigger way, we have to talk about, okay, dedicated training for people who are going to run workshops. And we have thoughts about creating a one month, pretty much an immersion training program where people would work with us, we would co-organize a workshop, and then the people would go to their own respective area and run a workshop there, like pretty much running it, maybe with a little bit of our assistance, to the point that they can start running that independently completely. I mean, we'd love to see many more things happen. The question right now is the skill set, the content, the, the training material, can people learn that and execute on that? So this is basically creating uh, training, which over time develops into the full immersion two-year work, two-year pretty much university replacement of education. But we got to get into the direction of training people. And maybe you can say maybe these webinars are the very first attempt at us trying to reach out to any form of training of the community. Um, naturally, workshops are where people learn a lot so that there's been people who actually came through a workshop and ended up running a workshop uh, after that. But we encourage that and would love to see that happen more. So if we can get, create curriculum training materials, that would be great. That, that's one of the many tasks on the, on the list to do. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Anybody else? I had one suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, you were talking about building communities, and such as Factor E Farm mm -hmm. is already, I think, growing into its own community. But it's it doesn't necessarily fit the need of something like a factory. Uh, my point is, mm -hmm. if there were a 30-acre plot of land that was dedicated to um, producing mm -hmm. the global construction set, mm -hmm. uh, they could distribute, uh, of course, with the costs being paid, they could distribute the different components to different communities uh, around the world, mm -hmm. but, but hopefully not around the world because you end up getting into a lot of transportation problems. But uh -huh. I'm, sorry, I'm sorry for not being precise. Let me see. This community would be more geared toward building the units for other mm -hmm. uh, young communities rather yeah. than just building its own things. I think that's that kind of approach would be good. Like, there's definitely a need for seed communities, seed facilities, pretty much places which can provide the skills, the training, the materials 
Like for example, if we have a CNC torch table, we can build another CNC torch table and seed another facility. If we've got a full genetic stock of our agricultural, polycultural plant outs for permaculture, we can start a nursery and, and generate stock for the next iteration. So basically, the more stock you have at one place, the easier it is for others to replicate. And the way we actually see replication happen is the immersion training, the two to four year training that we're thinking about for the future allows you to do exactly that. As part of that curriculum, you can generate all the stock, the genetic stock and the machine stock that allows you to do a replication. So that would be a very high value proposition. You basically come out of there with potentially all the stock that you need, all the seed, the kernel to start a new facility. And that's the way we'd like to look at it. Uh, for that, we need a few seed facilities, and then from that, I think the, the operations can really go viral around the world. Great. Yeah. Okay, so we're taking more questions. We've got a few more minutes left. It's about 2.16. Uh, we can go for five more minutes to make it not too long. I'll cut it at 2.20 here. So any other questions from the audience? and I hate to okay. dominate, but no one else is speaking up. No one else is um, taking it. Go ahead. It, it, uh, the, the factory type idea I was talking about, um, a person could actually pay to get away from capitalism. Uh, and the reason I say that is because that's my own personal feeling is that mm -hmm. it, I am just bombarded with planned obsolescence. I'm, I'm not an engineer by education, but I more or less engineer everything I see. And everything that I see that fails, which is almost everything on the market, has some kind of obvious planned obsolescence in it. And it's just driving me crazy. Mm -hmm. And if I could pay to get out of the capitalist system of scarcity, I would. And, and I feel like Factor E Farm is one of those, one of the possibilities of being a way that a person can come in and say, build me a brick press, mm -hmm. I want to build myself a house, mm -hmm. and, and they can actually pay to start their own little community and, and get out of the rat race, more or less. So um, I guess that's not really a question. What it's thoughts? Just, yeah, we've had many, many thoughts about that. I mean, what you, th that kind of a concept has been throughout the project, Vinay Gupta from the Hexayard project calls it buying out at the bottom. That means you don't need to spend um, an entire lifetime to retire or maybe to get a car and house. You can buy out at the bottom so-called when you have the other forms of capital like your ability to have the skills or the tools to be productive outside of the going through the whole formalities of the system. That's what you can do. But I mean that's this is the concept that the concept basically is that there's abundance for everybody, but of course not for one greedy person. It's the the productivity of the earth and nature is huge, starting with a 10,000 times more power from the sun that comes to the earth. There's no material energy norm and therefore material limits to, to prosperity, uh, but that requires a paradigm shift. Yes, people can pursue their dreams and visions for their whole life, not not have to go through their entire life doing something that they're alienated from that's the whole core of this premise that we we help people find their freedom and I mean we call it evolve to freedom and pursue those things like you know self-determination theory where it's autonomy mastery and purpose that drives us it's not the bigger carrot on a stick or you know that kind of thing like Daniel Pink's talk about the surprising science of motivation so the notions of having the capital, which capital can take many different forms. Right now, people are hung up on Wall Street capital, that you need this green paper to make everything work. No, you don't. You need natural resources. If you have the ability to tap those resources directly, you've got the most profound form of capital on this planet. And uh, people start to feel very secure and empowered when they know that they can use the resources around them to to make modern civilization happen. Now, today's society is, is of course far removed from that, 
but creating some forms of access, increased access to that, that's what we're about. We're just trying to push that limit, uh, so-called, to buy out at the bottom, if you may. The cost of living is actually pretty huge. There's a wiki page, I actually suggest that on a wiki. It's called the, it's called Cost of Living. And the facts are, an average life in the United States, you end up spending about a million bucks just to provide housing, cars, and grub on your table. Um, we spend pretty much all of our life just to survive, so-called. Uh, all that energy should be going to our creative pursuits and making civilization go forward rather than merely surviving. I mean, even in the Western societies, I mean, I come from Poland, I've seen the real material, secure, material scarcity there. Here we have artificial scarcity, uh, but that's something to transcend. And if we wake up as people, then we certainly can do much better. So there's yes, a I definite need. In order to transcend that, um, many, many people need to be informed that it doesn't take the kind of work, time, and effort that it used to exactly. on a farm to build a life. Uh, I, I think a lot of people in modern society still have a picture in their mind of a farmer getting up at 5 a.m. and not going to bed until after dark. Well, yeah. But with all of the technological advances that we have had, it's ridiculous to think that anybody should have to work more than maybe four hours a day. Right. That's, that's absolutely true. But you also have to say that in the present system, the life is brutal for just about anybody because an average farmer today ends up the big scale farmer has a cost of about a quarter million in equipment every four, about four, five years. I mean, so people are still on a treadmill. So the, the, the point is, you can do exactly what you say. Yes, you can be an idealistic hippie, run into the woods and do that. What you'll find is that you need skills and, and resources to be able to do that. Now, so that was the wake up for me, right? I mean, coming up from out of a PhD program, I thought, oh yeah, it's like, yeah, we can, make a great living and then I of course got killed by all the difficulties that come with starting with not having proper equipment nor any skills to give you another example you know to do agriculture like aquaponics which can I think can be very easy after you've got a masterfully crafted system that currently is not yet open source you know Right now, we have the confidence that we can totally crack that and crack the food security issue, absolutely, and open source that. But when I first started the lettuce, hydroponic lettuce, I got a great crop, then it got wiped out the next time by thrips. So you find out all these things that, in order to actually do it, there's some serious, serious skill set that is not being taught in today's world. And this is where we're trying to create it. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely, I mean access should be to prosperity should be had to by everybody not just a select few i mean it's a uh, general yeah i think agreement. people need to realize that it is possible right yeah and that's that's kind of like pushing the limits is by sh just by showing the radical examples of efficiency that we can by by these integrated productive systems is exactly what we're trying to do is trying to show that wow these things can happen i mean doing things like um, you know, the micro house four, basically, you know, a five day workshop where we pretty much built a house or building a, uh, the machine in a single day, uh, milestones like that are what raises attention. I mean, it's really powerful if you can show that that can be done and, um, yes. it is all feasible. It's a, definitely about waking people's consciousness to, to the possibility. I mean, my frustration some time ago was, oh, wow, well, why don't people see this, these amazing possibilities? Well, it's like, like, show me, I'm from Missouri, you know, kind I of deal. I watch your videos, and they are very much getting the word out that it's possible. Who is? Your videos. Yeah. Thank you so much for all of the videos. No, definitely. I watch them. We've just begun. I mean, this is, uh, if you talk about, I mean, right now, I'm not at all happy with our documentation. I mean, we're doing, we're trying to do a lot, but I think we really have to be even better like and and that will happen once we have even more and more product like we can crank out this you know say the august of 2016 i think that's something that's going to be pretty spectacular uh actually this this august of 2015 for the tractor extreme tractor build where we build the tractor and bulldozer we actually have an interactive 
video guy coming to document that so that should be a really killer video coming from that but i'd like to see actually kind of somewhat like maybe an osc uh news news show inspired by juice rap news <laughs> in that style somewhat but not getting that crazy but um some kind of a regular reporting where we show the ongoing story basically the storytelling that needs to happen i know i've done a lot very early on when i was just out there with my camera like by myself and capturing everything and now we got to return to that so i one of the things to do is to develop the collaborative editing processes using also uh, compositing software uh, that's open source to do that creating a working team around that so we can help that process come along and help help get that story out and it's part of the reason why i want to do these get these seminars webinars out there uh, to try to communicate everything that somebody needs to know to really get involved and all that but yes yeah, storytelling is a, is a huge part that we have to do uh, more of as we go forward as well because i think yeah the story it, it is amazing and i don't think um i mean i don't think anyone can feel it as as much as i do of course but i think i, I can definitely share a lot of that excitement by simple documentation and people um we have heard comments from certain workshops like wow, I didn't know I I couldn't didn't believe I could do this or whatever. So so that kind of transformative ex experience is all that we're about. So getting the workshops is a big part. And when we go forward, we definitely want to be careful about like the production aspect. If we talk about producing things, we want to include the education component with that as much as possible. The workshop model lends itself to that. Uh, but we can't forget about it because it's more than it's I mean the machines are somewhat of an excuse for doing much greater work of human transformation I mean we are providing the fundamental tools for survival but bigger than that it's like it's gonna start with the 51st machine which is the human I mean how do we actually evolve as humans is the real question because the same technology that we're developing I mean it already exists it's it's about how people use it and do we have the wisdom to to go forward so it's it boils down at the end of the day to education and pretty much cultural shift um that's made through providing real needs so yeah but that's i mean that's that's the kind of call out where uh, we'd like to excite all the chapters out there all the people doing similar work to collaborate and this year we're, we are reaching out a lot to all the open source communities to just gain collaborations and move forward there's just just a lot of good effort out there uh, we want to use that to the best for everybody's benefit. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. So maybe uh, one quick last question from anybody. Or otherwise, quit here. Um, anybody else have, have a? Yes, uh, Martian. What events do we have coming up? Why, certainly, Jonathan. We've got <laughs> just. Uh oh. They. What happened? Uh oh. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. I got too excited there. But uh, as far as the workshops happening in the near future, so no internet connection in Missouri, it seems. <laughs> now I was uh, hit the wrong button here. So. Imagine if it's on the microphone again, it would be better. Sorry, Marson, you're muted. Okay. We can hear you. I was talking to myself. I apologize. <laughs> as as normal. <laughs> So actually, okay, I hear the question, the workshops coming up. I mean, we've got three of them online, the Power Cube, the Micro Track, and the Miracle Orchard, Beyond Organic. Now, there's actually four more or five more that are not up there right now. By the June 1st, we're going to get up the, uh, there's the Gasifier workshop. Right after that is the open source land use planning using GIS. Um, open source site plan basically after that is so there's the miracle orchard workshop but right after that we're gonna have the tractor build in the middle of August that's coming up um, then the big that's the tr big tractor slash bulldozer build in August and the fifth one is the workshop on the permaculture workshop with Mark Shepard of Restoration Agriculture where we actually do the earthworks and ponds uh, using our equipment and that's our goal 
now there's actually two more I, I skipped early September we have an a forest workshop so a forest with two t's dot org or dot com maybe uh, so it, another TED fellow is running this uh, intensive afforestation kind of a program nonprofit business um, using the Miyawaki method of how you regenerate forests by these super fast growing um, processes so we're gonna have a workshop of that coming up and that's early September and I forgot to mention also the for the aquaponics we're gonna build the structure and systems and that's gonna be at the end of July that's gonna be after the looks like right now the miracle orchard workshop so there's a lot planned it's not online yet we're working on getting that out there so we can start publicizing that and getting the word out on all of that so that's about it okay well that will wrap it up for so, uh, sorry, I missed okay the whole, uh, discussion actually. excellent uh, to do, but, um, what's the uh, so I get it from what I heard that the business plan right now is still the workshops and you worked a lot on that is it correct summary of the business plan is to ramp up on the workshops indeed that's pretty much it now if you have missed it and are there again lots of people staying this summer on the farm uh, we've like shifted here, yeah actually we shifted from the the internships to pretty much full schedule full time of the workshops where which is expected to be like 20 to 40 people for all the workshops but fortunately all of this is recorded so you can view it and it's going to be up in about two hours and with that i'd like to wrap up with this event and so join us next week so next week we're going to hold our uh, next event and that is on how do we create a working team charter for those people actually getting into working teams on all the different projects that we have so thanks a lot for listening and um We'll be in touch again. Uh, download this video and and uh, and basically add links as as I discussed before, and spread this to your networks. And thanks a lot. We'll be in touch. And until next time, thank you.